Welcome to the Solar IMG podcast, and uh, today we've got a very special returning guest. Uh, some of you may remember Arnie Gunderson from uh, one of our previous podcasts and from the videos at Fairwinds.com. He is the chief engineer at Fairwinds Associates. Thanks for coming on the podcast on such short notice while you're traveling, Arnie. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, sorry about the quality because I'm on a cell phone, but looking forward to talking to you. Now, today it's it's been getting a little bit of mainstream media attention that uh, there's problems at Reactor 2. Um, they did the endoscopy thing. I, I'm not too, you know, up on, on the up and up. I was hoping you could please tell our uh, listeners what's up. Well, well, it's about time mainstream media paid a little attention to um, Reactor 2 or, and Fukushima in general. Um, what, they've, what they've been able to do is um, get into the reactor building at, at Unit 2. And, of course, reactor building is that box, and Unit 2 is the only one that still has a box. The others got blown to smithereens. So the, um, uh, they got into the reactor building and were able to put an um, endoscope down into the containment, not into the reactor, but into the containment. Um, so, you know, they've, they've entered the, uh, the dry, dry well, and then they're heading down the side of the vessel toward the, the suppression pool. And they had expected to find water at five meters and didn't find any, and four meters and didn't find any, and three and two and one, and they didn't find any water until they got to 60 centimeters. Now, that's, um, that's about two feet. So there's only two feet of water in the bottom of the containment. So the question becomes, where is it going? Because they're pouring in... Oh, five to ten uh, tons of water a day, and um, they had expected that it would be um, uh, there would be a high water level, and um, if it's high in the containment, they were hoping that it would run into the um, into the nuclear reactor as well, and they could have you know five or five or four meters of water in the nuclear reactor. Well, the problem is. Um, Without that amount of water for shielding, uh, it will be very difficult to remove any nuclear fuel. Um, it's a, it's a, it, there's two pieces. The, end, the endoscope determined that there wasn't much water. And 60 centimeters um, corresponds roughly to the lower lip of the, uh, the, the downcomer leg into the suppression pool. So I think it's pretty clear that there's damage in the suppression pool in um, in Unit 2. Now, that was um, postulated. I, I know I talked about it, but others did, too. Uh, there was an explosion in Unit 2, and, um, and it was likely to be in that leg between the, the dry well and the suppression pool. And it looks like that's the case. So... They're pouring water into the nuclear reactor. It's running out somehow, and uh, and is now um, not in the containment either. So it's leaking out of the containment. Now, the the other piece of that was, in addition to the endoscope, they also were able to put in a uh, a, a radiation detector, and they they couldn't put them in together, which is too bad. But as they uh, the lower they got the higher the radiation levels got, um, which clearly indicates that the nuclear core has slumped and is in the bottom of the reactor and, and also in the bottom of the containment. So I, it definitely indicates a meltdown. The, the numbers they got are absolutely astronomical. Um, 70 uh, sieverts an hour, and you got to slap two zeros on the end of that to get to REM, so it's 7,000 REM. Um, and, and a thousand will um, it will cause neurological damage and kill you in about fifteen twenty minutes. So we are well over uh, lethal exposures in uh, in a very short time. Now this late, you know, the accident is now uh, almost so the thirteen months old now, and um, so to see this high a level of radiation that far into the accident means that um, a lot of the Radiation has decayed away. Uh, most, you know, more than half of it disappeared in the first year. But at this point, now it will decay very slowly. Um, the the cesiums will decay. Half of the cesium, cesium one thirty four, will decay pretty quickly over the next ten years. Cobalt sixty will decay over the next 
50 years. But still, cesium-137, which is a, a nasty isotope, is going to be hanging around for 300 years. So um, a, this radiation that they're detecting is not going to go away. It's higher than in outer space. And, of course, we all know that, that, that space probes are, are heavily shielded because radiation damages the electronics. So the, the, the second concern here is how are we going to remove this even with a robot? Uh, because with these high radiation fields, it will wreck the integrated uh, uh, the circuits that are inside the, the robot. So uh, it's really been a, a, a severe setback to, um, to dismantle the plant. N nobody really knows how to handle these kinds of exposures um, in a outside of a, uh, you know, in a hot cell facility that's designed for it. This was never designed for it. So I, I guess my takeaway on it is, uh, is a couple things. One is uh, it just amped up the cost. This is, uh, you know, if it, if, if it was uh, $10 billion, it's probably $15 billion now. On just that reactor, you know, each of these reactors is going to um, uh, experience the same thing. So, so the cost is up. And two, the time has grown. Uh, whatever they thought they could do is now going to going to take longer. Um, but the, I, and I think the the sixty four thousand dollar question here is where is the core? Um, how much of it's in the nuclear reactor, and how much of it fell through the nuclear reactor? I believe through those control rod drive uh, uh, holes in the bottom of the reactor. How much of it's still in the nuclear reactor, and how much of it is in the um, uh, is on the bottom of the the, the dry well? Uh, that's um, uh, we know it's low, we know it's slumped, but exactly what part is still in the vessel and uh, how much is on the floor is, uh, is is really unknown. the The other piece of this is where is the water going? Um, it's obviously leaking into uh, other buildings, you know, the turbine hall, and, and uh, um, I was able to get a, um, uh, uh, a document from uh, a General Electric um, startup engineer, um, and it's uh, it's an old document. It dates to the early um, uh, the the early 80s, and the, the, the document said that um, the penetrations between the containment and uh, and other buildings are likely to fail in the event of an accident in a Mark I containment. Well, what that means is that, um, you know, in, in the incredible heat and the incredible pressure they had in the containment, not only did the, the lid of the containment lift, like I talk about on the Fairwinds video, but, but in addition, probably within four or five, maybe six days, the penetrations where the electrical wires come in started to rot out. Uh, it's exacerbated because it's salt water. So you've got, you know, rubber penetrations going through a concrete containment and um, with, with high heat, high radiation, high humidity, and high pressure. And on top of that, oh, by the way, we're, we're putting salt water on the, uh, on the, uh, the penetration. So, so my guess is the penetrations are, um, uh, are failing as well allowing all of that water, five tons a, a day or more, to leak into other buildings. So I guess, <laughs> wow, um, you, you went over to Japan and you did the samples. That's well covered on, on Fairwinds in your latest video, so I'm not going to beat a dead horse. But at, at the beginning, when we realized that this was a, a real serious situation, we were kind of derided and called paranoid, and, you know, it's not even nearly as bad as Chernobyl, some people said. But now the mainstream media is, is starting to come out with this. Why now? Um yeah, I was attacked by Rush Limbaugh on, um, on on radio. After I was on CNN once or twice, he was calling me a fear monger. And, um, and of course, you know, the time has proven that, uh, if anything, I was conservative. Um, why now is a, a really good question. Um, I, I think the, the mainstream media had in their mind that this is a problem that's going to go away. And... It, it's not going away. It's like um, it, it's like one of these horror movies where the the creature keeps coming up from the grave. You know, they they um, they claim it's in um, in cold shutdown, and all at once we have problems like this. Uh, I, I think um, you know Chepko has uh, actually created this problem by trying to minimize the problem. If 
if they had said immediately or, or even six months later that this is a, a real bad problem and we're in it for a 50-year slog here, um, that would have been one thing. But they've always said, well, you know, we're, we're getting close to getting it under control. And um, it, it, they were going to wrestle this bucking bronco to the ground. Uh, but it's not happening, and, um, it, and it can't happen. The laws of physics are telling us that this is, um, this is a 50-year battle, and uh, um, in the end, they're going to spend a lot of money, and in the end, they're going to dismantle the plant. But between now and year one and year 50, they're, um, uh, it's going it's to cost a lot of radiation exposure to workers, and it's going to cost a lot of money and um, create a lot of technology. Uh, there's nothing on the market now that can even begin to handle the problems they're facing. So um, with this is, um, uh, you know, probably you're, uh, I, I'm not sure how old you are, but um, when you have grandkids, they'll still be watching the Fukushima decommissioning. Wow, that's that's absolutely incredible. A lot of the monitoring stations have been taken down, and they've they've stopped doing a lot of the, the air monitoring and the rain monitoring. Some of the folks who are responsible for this have uh, acknowledged that they've had communications problems. And, and when I tried, you know, I'm used to, you know, having a wonderful relationship with uh, the powers that be. But when I, you know, try to get somebody to speak about this, it was a, you know, a three-month battle, and it was very heavily managed. And I, I just wasn't used to that or expecting that. <laughs> people are really concerned about the water, especially in Hawaii. I know people who love to, to scuba dive and, and surf and whatnot. Um, people are actually seriously considering relocating from Hawaii. Um, I think this may be a kind of a rash idea, but how can people minimize their risk in these contaminated areas? Well, I, I think uh, the, the ocean's a big place, and uh, there's an enormous amount of, of cesium leaking into it at, at Fukushima, but, of course, it, it, it does get diluted by the time it gets to Hawaii. Um, I'm, I guess I'm more worried about the, the bioaccumulation of the food chain and, uh, you know, seeing top predators like, like tuna and salmon and barracuda and things like that um, become contaminated over the next two, three, four years with increasingly high amounts of cesium. Uh, what you said is right on, though. There, there's no monitoring of this. Uh, the last I heard, the U.S. government had monitored about 300 fish in the last year total. Um, so, you know, clearly we're importing tens of millions and we're only looking at 200. So we're not going to... Uh, we have a system designed not to find the contamination problem. The, the other piece of this is the, um, um, you know, the, the debris field is heading toward Hawaii and, and the West Coast. You know, I, I'm, I'm, most of that debris came from the tsunami, and the tsunami hit up and down the coast. So it's not all Fukushima debris. But, uh, but some of it certainly came from within, you know, 10 or 20 miles of the, the reactor. And, um, and some of that's likely to be contaminated. Remember, in the, I guess it was the third or fourth day, the Ronald Reagan was 100 miles offshore and was picking up contamination on its deck. So if the Reagan got contaminated 100 miles away, I think it's reasonable to think that the debris field uh, got contaminated as well. Now, it's been out at sea for a year and, and had waves sloshing over it and stuff like that, but, but still I think um, that we will find some of that debris um, uh, come come across the, the Pacific and wind up contaminated. So I hope that when when people um, pick through that debris, one there's there's personal effects in it and, and that that deserve uh, to be honored. Uh, so I, I hope that people you know, honor the personal effects. But separately, though, um, you know I hope they have their inspectors out and are are checking for radiation as well because um, some of that debris has got to be contaminated. I, my heart really goes out to the Japanese people. I, I feel um, <laughs> very much for them. And I'm also concerned about the, the, the service members of the 7th Fleet. But, you know, even the Russians rejected a shipment of auto parts. And, I, and, and when I think about Russia, the first thing that comes to my mind isn't exactly safety standards. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> people have sent us um, uh, car, car air filters. And uh, not to us, but to the lab. They sent it directly. But um, 
one one person did send us a, a box of um, of air filters, and uh, um, I have a, you know, a Geiger counter at home, and I, I approached the box, and uh, I didn't even have to open it up, and my Geiger counter was was going uh, uh, way upscale. So um, you, you know, when you sell a car to um, the, the Japanese, have very high standards for uh, inspection. So a car that the Japanese can't drive anymore gets sold to Australia or gets sold to uh, the Soviet Union. And um, um, nobody's changing out the air filters and things like that. So um, um, I'm sure that if at the docks people opened up the air filters and and checked them out, uh, you would find uh, contaminated um, air filters. I mean, if if somebody sent me a box full of them... uh, in, in Vermont, uh, I'm, I'm sure that that same problem exists wherever those um, those imported uh, used cars are sent. Many of us have seen the infamous photo of, of the, the site on fire as the tsunami approached, so that would tend to indicate that there was a failure at the plant before the tsunami even hit. Um, and, and still many people aren't aware of that, which is kind of surprising. Um, and this model is is in use all over. But what about other types of reactors, like for example, the Candu reactors? Do they have similar uh, issues that may lead them to have problems when during an earthquake? Yeah, let me get back to your preamble there. I have not seen a picture of the site on fire before the the tsunami hit. There was a fire, but I believe it's at an oil refinery that's several miles away. And while the, the way the picture is taken, um, it's hard to differentiate. But I, I think the, uh, the fire that occurred before the tsunami was not on site. Now, I don't, I don't mean to minimize, though. Uh, it's pretty clear that Unit 1 at, at Fukushima uh, Daiichi was, um, was in trouble before the tsunami hit. You know, there was high radiation in the reactor building. There was high radiation at the fence post in the first hour. And, of course, they had the trouble with the isolation condenser and things like that. So um, then, of course, it was the first one to melt down, the first one to explode, first one to run out of water. Um, so something happened in Unit 1 before the tsunami hit. I don't know what it is, but obviously it's seismically, seismically induced. So that throws a monkey wrench into the, the nuclear industry's seismic analysis. I mean, these plants were designed to withstand the earthquake that hit that site. It was a 9 out in the ocean, but on, on land it was a, a, a 7.9. And the plan was close, but, but designed to withstand something that severe. And yet Unit 1 failed, and that's, uh, that, that should be a major, uh, a major concern for the industry because the codes that they used and the, the, the snubbers and the, the pipes that were in that plant should not have broken, but it appears that one did. Now, the other part of your question is what about other reactors um, around the world? You know, I'm on record, and it's on the site, uh, on the Fairwind site, but I'm on record saying that the Mark I should be shut down anywhere uh, in the U.S. or uh, in uh, there's a few in other countries as well. But the Candu reactors are entirely different, and, uh, you know, like all these, they have their advantages and they have their, their disadvantages. Um, the, uh, one of the disadvantages of the Kendo reactors is that they have a, a, a positive reactivity coefficient. And what that means is that as they enter an accident, as, as, as temperature goes up, power in an American reactor goes down. That's a negative uh, reactivity coefficient. But in the Kendo reactors, it goes up. And uh, um, it, in a way, they're similar to Chernobyl, although there's certainly, there's certainly differences as well. The 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 Candu uh, the reactors. Uh, one of my concerns uh, is that um, the uh, the Canadian government spun off the Candu reactors, and one of their owners now is their employees through pension funds. And you know, if you're um, an employee worried about getting your pension, um, the last thing you want to do is shut the nuke down that's providing one your income and two your chance at a pension. So I, I think there's some uh, there's an opportunity in the system um, for people to um, knowingly um, minimize safety concerns 
because uh, their owners in the in the pension fund that's driven by, of course, keeping that reactor running for a long time. So, um, uh, you know, it's not just hardware problems, but institutional problems that uh, that concern me a lot. Wow. Well, what do you what do you think is on tap for? Um the rest of this year, uh, are we going to continue to see more emissions? Are we going to continue to see more bioaccumulation? I know you've you've mentioned the rice, you've mentioned the tuna. Um, what, what do you think is in store? Well, you know, we're just getting to the point where the the, uh, the cedar is is pollinating in uh, Japan right around now, and it'll be interesting to see what the um, um, what the uh, exposures are uh, from that. Um, you know, it's. This year is going to be better than last year because a, a lot of that material has been washed off and has gone into uh, uh, lakes, rivers, and ultimately into the ocean. So a, a lot of the land crops over time will um, will gradually uh, decrease in concentration. But you know, every time a farmer takes a blade to that, he turns over that soil and brings up the um, the cesium that that has gradually gradually worked down. Now, the cesium, of course, is a, it's a muscle seeker and um, uh, creates a, a phenomenon called Chernobyl heart. Uh, in developing kids, uh, the cesium hits the heart muscle and causes uh, heart defects. So it, it's the one we track, one, because it's easiest uh, to see in, a, in most common uh, instruments, pick it up pretty easily. But the other part of it is that the... Um, um, is that it's it's nasty, you know. It's uh, it and strontium are, um, are are two of the worst um, isotopes. The strontium, on the other hand, um, I I know it's out there and that will bioaccumulate, uh, but that causes leukemias that that manifest in twenty or thirty years. We're just now there was a study out of the um, University of Pittsburgh that saw a statistically meaningful increase in leukemias. From uh, from people near Three Mile Island. So here is 30 years out, and we're just now getting the studies that show, uh, you know, statistically meaningful increases in in uh, uh, in leukemias. And and Three Mile Island was, uh, you know, one thousandth of what Fukushima was. So sorry about that. Meanwhile, if I light up a smoke while I'm having a beer at a bar, I'm going to get a ticket and kicked out. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Arnie, for taking the time to, co- to speak with us. Um, I really appreciate your work, and I know that a lot of our listeners are big fans. I'd encourage everyone to stay tuned to fairwinds.com to keep, keep posted, and, and uh, thank you very much for your tireless and intrepid work to keep all of us informed. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, in parting, I think, again, I've said it before, we all owe a debt of gratitude to about 1,000 or 2,000 men and women, mainly men, in Japan, who um, who risked their lives in those first three weeks? Um, without those guys, uh, Japan would have been would have been cut in half. You know, we're uh, I'm speaking to you on um, uh, you know March 28th, and of course you know TMI began the 28th and it was was probably as worse on the 29th to 30th. So um, you know we've had um, our accident, the, the Russians had theirs, and now the the, the Japanese are uh, are experiencing it as well. Hopefully, we'll learn from these lessons. Thanks again. Thanks, yeah. And just on the record, you're not an opponent of nuclear power. You're just a proponent of safe nuclear power. You got it. Thank Uh you. All right. Thank you very much, Arnie, and we'll say a prayer for the Fukushima 1000. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.